Hey guys, it's L Supersonic Hugh here with a different kind of video today. So, something I've been noticing a lot on my live streams lately is that a lot of fans have asked me to go to the Lost Media Wiki and read through some articles live on stream. Something else I've been noticing a lot recently is a large number of requests for topics that fans want me to cover in videos, so I decided let's combine both of those ideas and cover some of the topics you guys want me to put in videos through Lost Media Wiki articles as we browse through them and I read through them and we just see what they're all about. So the topics come from a tweet that I posted on Twitter not too long ago where I asked you guys what some of your favorite articles from the Lost Media Wiki are and these are the ones that we will be using for this video. I will get through all of them and they're numbered for a particular reason because rather than going through each of them one by one, I have a random number generator that's going to randomly come up with a number, and that number will correspond to the article we read, just for a little twist. So with that said, I'm kind of excited to get into this, and it won't just be a straight up like reading through the article. I'll give my thoughts, I'll give my opinions about it. We might discover some information we didn't know before. So with that said, let's go to the list, which is right here. So these are all from Twitter, and there's 46 of them in total. So let's find out what our first article will be. 33. Okay. So 33 is... RCA recording of BBC television service, which was requested by Jacob McKenzie at Green Orb. So some of these, I'm not too sure what they are. So it might take a little bit of time searching for... Oh, here it is. It's the only article on the site. So here we go. RCA recording of BBC television service. Found footage of pre-Second World War BBC television broadcast 1938. So this was actually found in 1999. I actually did not know that our first article was going to be about found media, but that's cool. And I don't know what this is about. So let's find out. BBC television service, now known as BBC One, is a British television channel controlled by the British broadcast company, BBC. It officially launched Britain's first public television broadcasts on the 2nd of November 1936, and its usage of both 240-line Baird and its eventual successor, 405-line Marconi EMI system, meant that it was also regarded as the first regular television service to be broadcasting in high definition. I'm not a big television guy, so I don't really know what a lot of that means, but... Okay, so it was basically the beginning of the BBC. Prior to the Second World War... Its broadcasts proved enticing for its audience, limited mainly by the high cost of owning a television back then. After ceasing transmissions on the 1st of September 1939 due to the outbreak of the war, it resumed normal programming on the 7th of June 1946 and continues broadcasting to the present day. So that's interesting. It seems to have existed at one point in time before the war, then it stopped during the war, and then it came back after the war, and that is currently what you will see today if you were to watch it while in Britain. Fate of pre-Second World War broadcasts. Despite the historic nature of BBC television service, almost all of its pre-Second World War broadcasts are now permanently missing. While some media presented on the channel, like third-party cartoons and films, indirectly survived to the present day, original programming was transmitted live. It would not be until post-World War II that direct recordings of live broadcasts were technologically possible. Some, like the footage of the 1938 FA Cup final, survive only because a cine film camera recorded the footage alongside the TV cameras. Most were not so lucky, and for these programs, they immediately became lost forever following their airings, with only still photographs and Radio Times listings providing evidence of these shows' existence. Media affected include Anne and Harold, the first episodic television series, and a television adaptation of the Agatha Christie short story, The Wasp's Nest. So that's actually pretty interesting. People always ask me all the time, like, for pieces of lost media that, you know, are never going to resurface, or like, what are some examples of that? This is actually a really good example of stuff that is never going to resurface. This stuff that was broadcast, and after it was done being broadcast, like, it wasn't saved. So that's it. And it's cool that there are actually separate articles for some of these topics as well. The 1939 RCA recording. However, while no direct recordings were possible, surprisingly, one instance of a pre-World War II broadcast compilation remains publicly accessible thanks to an indirect recording. Additionally, the footage was recorded not in the United Kingdom, but in New York. Back then, a BBC television broadcast should not have been possible in America, 
because the original Alexandra Palace recordings could generally travel less than 30 miles before ceasing. However, in November 1939, unusual changes in the atmosphere commenced when sunspots affected the ionosphere, causing television broadcasts to be bounced off of it. Consequently, New York could receive broadcasts transmitted around 3,000 miles away, with the first reported instance of this occurring during an episode of Sea Stories. Meanwhile, the Radio Corporation of America, RCA, were researching commercial television development opportunities within America since 1929. During their research in New York, RCA researchers came across the BBC broadcasts and began to view said footage from its own developed television system. It was decided that recording some footage would prove useful for further RCA television development. Four minutes of footage was therefore recorded on a 16mm film through a camera placed in front of a TV screen. For many years afterwards, rumors surrounding an American recording of early BBC television broadcasts were made, but without any footage being available were unsubstantiated. Then, in the 1990s, British freelance researcher and writer Andrew Emerson began investigating the matter. He first contacted NBC if the footage was present in their laboratories, but searches came up empty. He then contacted RCA, who could not find their recordings within their archives. Finally, Emerson requested that the American Vintage Wireless Collectors Society mention the footage in its magazine, and to request any possible collector to contact them. Ultimately, Maurice Schester, a New York television studio employee and a television media collector, contacted the magazine stating he had one of the RCA recordings. After a digital cleanup and video cassette transfer, the recording was sent to Emerson. The recording was then shown at the National Museum of Photography, Film and Television in Bradford on the 26th of June, 1999. As of the present day, it belongs in the Alexandra Palace Television Society archives and is publicly accessible. Another mystery surrounded what was recorded by RCA, given the poor quality of the surviving footage. The footage is confirmed to have included shots of Jasmine Bly and Elizabeth Cowell, both of whom were BBC announcers. Additionally, a costume drama, a cartoon, and a BBC station identity card were also recorded. Regarding the identity of the cartoon, a web archive reviewer by the name of D.G. Mavrov found that the recorded scene came from Walt Disney Productions' Silly Symphonies film Mother Goose Melodies. In the scene, an illustration of Little Miss Muffet shown, where a spider successfully scares away Miss Muffet from eating her curds and whey. The spider then proceeds to scare the viewer, before happily gulping down several spoonfuls of curd and whey from the bowl. It then uses its web as a rope to drag itself and the bowl up to the treetop, only for the web to break, causing the bolt to smash and the spider to be covered in curds and whey, much to its dismay. While the footage does indeed match up with the film scene in question, this also suggests the recording compilation was made beyond November. Indeed, Mother Goose Melodies was not shown in November, but a Radio Times issue lists it as being broadcast on the 4th and 6th of December. Meanwhile, the identity of the costume drama has remained unconfirmed. A theory by one web archive reviewer by the name of Gina1957 suggests that it could be The White Chateau, a wartime play broadcast on the 11th of November. Another likely candidate is An Elephant in Arcady, a costume drama which was broadcast on the 28th of November and on December 4th, the latter being the same day as a Mother Goose Melodies broadcast. And that's the article. Here's the gallery with the Silly Symphonies. Here's four minutes of the BBC from 1938 and some images from a newspaper. And there's also, there's so much more BBC related television lost media. I mean, here are all the articles you could read. Um, I know that like Doctor Who is one of the most famous examples of BBC lost media stuff. Yeah, you guys can definitely look through all this stuff. There's BBC sports television. I didn't even know that it was this extensive. And yeah, there you go. There is the article for the RCA recording of BBC television broadcasts. So what article will we get next? Let's find out. 35, okay. Didn't go too far. So this was suggested by Tanukis at Magical Leaf Dreams, and the article is Lego Beneath the Fantasy. So I actually don't know a whole lot about Lego Lost Media. I never really got into it. Um, it looks like this is a game, 
And I do have a little bit of experience with Lego games. I remember as a kid, I played one on my computer. Uh, I don't know which one it was, but it was like just, it was kind of like a city, like you build a city with Legos. It may have been just called like Lego City or something. Um, but that's about it for my knowledge of like Lego lost media and stuff. So um, I don't know what this is about. And it looks like this actually is lost, like completely lost. So let's find out. Beneath the Fantasy, Lost Build of Cancelled Lego Island spin-off game, 1997 to 1999. I actually have heard of the Lego Island games before, so this is related to that. So maybe I have come across it in passing. Beneath the Fantasy was a planned spin-off game in the Lego Island series. The game would have taken place in the ocean and would have possibly been based on the Lego Aquazone or Lego Divers themes. Beneath the Fantasy was going to be developed and published by Mindscape. Uh, so there's a picture on the side there. The only known teaser from the elevator. Uh, background. In 1996, the LEGO group invested $2 million into developing LEGO-themed video games. This was done in part to help expand the LEGO brand beyond LEGO sets and into other mediums of entertainment. On September 26, 1997, the first LEGO video game titled LEGO Island was released. The game was met with great success, and before the release of LEGO Island, six more games were already in the planning stages. Beneath the Fantasy is the most notable out of the six games, as there is an easter egg in LEGO Island that shows a teaser for the game. In an interview with a LEGO Island fan site, director Wes Jenkins says that yes, the second floor was an homage. Hey, cool that you went there. We thought it was funny that the ocean was on the second floor. Referring to the second floor of the elevator in the game where the easter egg can be spotted. So its cancellation says that in the same interview, Wes Jenkins also talks about why Beneath the Fantasy was cancelled. Well, time, budget, technology, and other, but mostly because Mindscape got in a dispute with LEGO over distribution and lost their contract. Political issues mostly. They didn't realize the potential profits of the product and what LEGO was about. In fact, they couldn't quite understand why we didn't just do simple 2D program instead of 3D. Is that libelous? No, I didn't mention any names. Maybe I should just say some people from some unknown places seemed less than enthusiastic and were paranoid every step of the way. Mindscape had also fired the entire team that had worked on LEGO Island a day before the release, prompting any spin-offs to be shelved. No other gameplay footage or teasers are known to exist outside of what was shown on LEGO Island. Wow. So yeah, that I guess it is a matter of the game kind of being announced before it was really worked on and then cancelled, but I actually wouldn't have guessed that the cancellation was over things like that. Um, I feel like a lot of the charm of the LEGO games is the fact that they are in 3D. I mean, imagine playing like a 2D LEGO game, it wouldn't really work the same. But it's kind of cool that they were able to like slip in that cameo into the first LEGO Island that did get released, but it is too bad that like uh, Fantasy didn't and the other games that were like planned to release, this could have been like a whole series of content and instead it was just the one game and like everyone left with like a sour taste and that was kind of it. So that's that's actually a little unfortunate. And then here are the links to some magazine articles and interviews that were used in this article. Okay, so what will the next article be? Number 30. Number 30 was requested by the Ekran Rider, and their article of request was the F04 Kids Dub. So this was actually a topic that I've covered in a video before, but it's been quite a while since I have. So it'll be nice to revisit the article and maybe see if there's any new um, updates to it. So this is getting into really cool areas of content because 4Kids is such a lost media rabbit hole and F-Zero is maybe one of the bigger mysteries from the 4Kids um, rabbit hole, which I guess I won't spoil it, we'll, we'll read the article. So F-Zero GP Legend, lost unaired episodes of 4Kids English dub of anime based on racing game franchise 2004-2005. There's the series title card and yes, some of these episodes are really lost. F-Zero GP Legend, known as F-Zero Falcon Densetsu in Japan, is a Japanese anime that premiered on October 7th, 2003 on TV Tokyo, and ended its run on September 28th, 2004. It lasted for a total of 51 episodes. So yes, the series was very popular in Japan. It is based off of the F-Zero video game franchise from Nintendo, and had its own game based off the anime that was released around the same time. F-Zero GP Legend was eventually dubbed into English by 4Kids Entertainment and premiered on the Foxbox block, later renamed to 4Kids, on September 4th, 2004. Out of the 51 episodes that aired in Japan, 
only the first 15 episodes of the English dub were aired, since the show was cancelled, likely due to low ratings. The remaining 36 episodes of the English dub for F-Zero GP Legend have never resurfaced. Taking place in the year 2201, F-Zero GP Legend revolves around a character named Ryu Suzaku, Rick Wheeler in the dub. After suffering an injury at work, Ryu is placed into cryogenic freeze until a cure for his injuries could be found. By the time a cure was found, it was 150 years after he was injured. After having been brought back by the secret galactic police, Ryu is now tasked with stopping corruption within the F-Zero races. English Broadcasts F-Zero GP Legend aired in the US on September 4, 2004, to coincide with the US release of the video game with the same name. With four kids taking up the task of localizing the show, many alterations were made, including name changes. Ryu Suzaku was changed to Rick Wheeler, and Miss Killer was changed to Lunar Rider. F-Zero GP Legend aired on the Fox Box block in the US on Saturday mornings at 10.30 a.m. EST. Despite a massive promotional campaign by Foxbox, F-Zero GP Legend turned out to be a flop in the ratings. After 15 episodes, the series was prematurely pulled from the air, though it was rumored that two additional episodes were dubbed before the series cancellation. Many cite the vague plot for the show's low ratings. And here's the full English cast of characters. Um, I know that David Wills is a pretty popular voice actor in the community, and he played Captain Falcon. As for availability, and this is kind of where we're going to get into, like, really interesting stuff with how it was available and released. Most of the episodes that aired of the English dub are available online. However, it seems that there may have been more episodes dubbed than the 15 that have aired. The last episode that aired is Target Tanaka, which premiered three months after the episode before, on March 5th, 2005, and was shortly after the Fox Box was renamed to 4Kids TV. The following episode, Super Scam, was scheduled for airing the weekend after, on March 12th, 2005, but was preempted for the second airing of Sonic X. Since then, F-Zero GP Legend has not aired again in the United States. Because episodes like Super Scam never aired, that makes the episode unavailable to the public and likely never will be. This leaves the fate of this episode and the rest of the unaired English dub unknown. It is also unknown how many episodes were actually dubbed in English. So this is what I want to kind of make a point of. So earlier in the article, it said that uh, the remaining 36 episodes of the English dub were never found. Now, I believe that kind of comes from one of my sources, which actually was uh, David Wills. Back when I was doing research on this topic, I asked him specifically if the Falcon Punch scene from the anime was dubbed in English. And the Falcon Punch scene was, I think, shown in the very last episode of the series. And David Wills claimed that it was English dubbed. He did do a dub for that voice clip. So that led me to believe that all 51 episodes must have been dubbed if they did an English version of the last episode. However, what I believe is more likely the case is that they probably either cut out a lot of the episodes in between or like edited some of them together. So the full English series isn't actually the 51 episodes that Japan got. It's probably edited down to like 26, which was pretty common at the time. And to finish this part of the article, it says Cherry Lane Music Company, who acquired the rights to various television shows, including other four kids shows like Pokemon, filed the copyright document Dr. C. Inboat 3 on May 17, 2010. The document contains music and episode titles from television shows, including F-Zero GP Legend. The document only lists seven episodes, including episode 18, The Secret in the Sanic. <laughs> Wait, what? I have to see if that's real. Okay, well, here it is. It actually is real. Secret in the Sanic. Um, along with a bunch of other F-Zero stuff as well. So yeah, this kind of leads to another part of kind of the mystery, and here's actually my video, is who has the rights to the series and where the other episodes are. Um, it was believed for a while that Discotech Media could possibly get the rights because they've released a lot of obscure anime before, and I believe even some four kids releases. But they've been asked about this show many times in the past, and as far as I know, nothing has come of it. Not only that, but I was seeing some of the comments here, and yeah, there are other broadcasts of this show and other dubs of this show, and people have been trying to document them and get an episode count on them. I'm not sure where their current standing is, and unfortunately this article doesn't really do a good job of uh, stating that, 
but I believe we found at least like 26 episodes in a different language foreign dub. So um, it may have been like, I don't remember which, it may have been like a Hungarian dub, I think. So that suggests that like, you know, those main 26 episodes were probably the same one that, you know, four kids had, you know, localized for the U.S. So we're probably looking for around 26 episodes. But still, the fact is we're unsure if we're even going to be able to get them because we, we don't really know who has them or who is going to end up with the rights to release them. Okay, so the next topic is number 38. Okay, we've been getting a lot of 30s so far. This is from um, Philippine Television Archives, and the request was Incarnacion Becavis. I believe that's a, a lost ad. Yes, it's right here. I've heard of this one before, I believe. This was a pretty popular one. I have heard of this one before, though. This is familiar to me. Filipino lost media is actually a area of content that I've kind of been noticing is getting more popular. Um, of course, one of the big topics I know of is Batman fights Dracula. That's one that I did a whole video about. But this is also something I've heard about in passing before. There's actually no picture for the uh, for this commercial. Incarnacion Bacavis is a Filipino flower shop located in Molina, Philippines. Sometime during the 1990s, they produced a memorable commercial spot that would have aired locally on the ABC5, now TV5, GMA7, RPN9, and IBC13 television channels, and also possibly ABS-CBN. The commercial is well known for having been unintentionally disturbing to viewers. Oh, of, of course it is. No copy of the commercial has been uploaded online, and it is considered lost, which is, I guess, why there's no um, picture of it in this article. Uh, premise. The commercial starts off with the camera zooming into flowers in front of a dark background. The song, Shepherd Moons by Enya, begins playing in the background. It fades into another scene with a couple, with the text Incarnacion Bacavez in Alex brush font appearing on screen. It then continues to fade through two more scenes featuring flowers. Finally, it fades into a scene featuring a lady in a red dress, some remember it as black or white, facing away from the camera. The lady turns to look at the camera, smiling through disheveled hair and holds roses up to her face, further obscuring it. The camera pauses on the shot of the lady's face until ultimately fading into another screen with the logo and the address of the shop's three branches. At this point, a male narrator intones. When the occasion becomes special, you can make it more special with flowers. From Encarnacion Bacavas. Encarnacion Bacavas, when you want to show how much you really care. Some people claim that a lady was portrayed by Filipino actress Sita Astals, but this has not been confirmed. It is, however, generally agreed that her scene was much more unsettling than necessary to promote flowers. I actually have, so I actually have, have heard about this before, like in passing, but I didn't know this, the specific details about it. I, it doesn't really sound scary, like on, on paper, I guess. Um, like Clockman and stuff like had scary elements to it and and stuff and other lost ads were unsettling. I don't know. This one doesn't, it doesn't really have that same kind of like scary feeling to me, but I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just me. Availability. Although there is no official documentation of its existence found online, the earliest known mention of the commercial goes back to the 2000s in the Pinoy Exchange Forum, at which point the commercial was still airing. There are currently no copies of the commercial available online, and the only proof of its existence now is the countless recollections of its viewers. The general consensus is that this commercial was aired in the 1990s up to the early 2000s. There are claims to have seen it as early as 1984 through 2002, but Enya's Shepherd Moons was not released until 1991. Well, I guess they could have used a different song maybe? Some people are remembering the song incorrectly? It seems to have mainly appeared on the TV channels ABC5, now TV5, between WWF Raw is War and WWF Superstars, now WWE, RPN9, now CNN Philippines, between The Million Dollar Chance of a Lifetime and Goggle V, and IBC13 between Mask Man, Masked Rider Black, and All Star Wrestling. Someone also said it may have aired on ABS, CBN, and The World Tonight, and GMA7, also simply known as GMA, between Eat, Balaga, NBA, and NFL games, and playoff games including the Super Bowl. However, there is no further evidence to count this claim. According to several reminisces, the commercial aired after a family rubbing alcohol commercial and was followed by an RA Home Vision commercial, now both also lost. 
It is also remembered to have aired alongside an Anzal Urethra car paints commercial, which is available online. On January 7, 2017, YouTube user Emmanuel Cordero U uploaded an audio recreation of the commercial using Shepard Moons as the background music. And the gallery... Okay, the gallery has audio recreations, video recreations, but this stuff isn't very useful. This is actually what got Hitogata so confusing and mixed up is because there were so many recreations that were being made. Um, so it does seem like it's mostly just claims that this exists and there's no real, there's no real evidence. It's interesting that so many specific channels and shows that the commercial could have aired in between were mentioned in this article, but even though we have those specifics... No one can actually track down those recordings and, like, find it. I suppose, like, maybe VHS recording wasn't super relevant in the Philippines back then. I Maybe it really wasn't a thing at all. I, I'm not really sure. Um, but I guess that's where I would think to look first would be, like, recordings. If, if we know that it aired in these shows, like, you'd think to look there first. Um, and I'm assuming, like, the um, actress was probably not contacted or maybe they can't be contacted. I'm sure the flower shop is maybe not there anymore. Maybe they wouldn't even have it anymore. This gets into a whole rabbit hole with international lost media that is very, very hard to um, kind of dig into because you're dealing with so many things outside of your control, right? Like, I'm surprised that maybe the actress hasn't been contacted yet, but I've looked for people that were associated with the Batman Fights Dracula uh, movie. And most of those people even the ones that are still around have no social media presence whatsoever. So I can imagine this being a very hard to find um, piece of lost media, especially when you're only going off of recollections. But I guess if there's anything to say about it, it's for the fact that this is getting attention. Like I have seen it be discussed before. And um, this is actually a really interesting one. Like add that to the list of international lost media that I think would be cool to kind of look into more. Okay, and the last one for this video is number 10. So we're out of the 30s now. We're in 10. And that is suggested by Mr. Bones at the Mr. Bones Show. And the topic is the Earthworm Gym Pilot. So let's take a look at that one. So this is another topic that I'm actually pretty familiar with. Um, because I remember it be being discussed quite a bit uh, not too long ago. And there's some really interesting pieces of found media i guess that go along with this even though the whole pilot is still lost so let's check this out earthworm jim partially found unaired pitch pilot of kids wb animated series 1995 earthworm jim is a 2d side-scrolling platformer created by doug tennepal and developed by shiny entertainment in 1995 an animated series was created by universal cartoon studios and aired on kids wb which would go on for two seasons before this a pitch pilot was made, featuring a slightly different design for Jim. Information on the pitch pilot is scarce, with very few sources coming forward over the years to provide information about its development. Due to this, the pilot remains partially found, with clips and promotional stills giving us some insight into the development process of the cartoon series. Per the former website of comic and animation artist Will Minoin, who was working on another Universal series at the time, Exo Squad, Doug Tendenpal created a series of gag sketches for the reel. These sketches were extrapolated into a storyboard by Minoin, and then into a fully animated reel. Tendenpal also provided most of the voice work for the reel. Content. The full contents of the pitch pilot are currently unknown at the time of writing. By reading the timestamps provided in magazine scans and promotional stills, some have come to the conclusion that the pilot is only a minute long. However, this is just speculation, and the actual length of the pilot is unknown. Clips of the pitch pilot have been used to promote the Earthworm Jim cartoon series and are featured in promotional bumpers for the show. From what is shown, there is very little dialogue, but Jim's voice more closely matches that of his video game counterpart at the time. Characters that would end up not appearing in the final cartoon series, such as Major Mucus, are shown in the pilot for a brief amount of time. As for magazine scans, in June of 2018, Twitter user AWDTwit provided a magazine scan with images of the pilot with the following caption. Finally found it. Look at these really creepy screen caps for the Earthworm Jim cartoon pilot. I'm curious what the whole thing looked like, and why did they make him so fat? Details about the magazine have not been provided, and it's currently unknown which publication it comes from. Sources have narrowed down the publication as possibly being Electronic Gaming Monthly, 
but the year and month of the magazine article are currently unknown. And that's a pr that's a pretty big detail that I feel like should have either been known about or something because I want to say if there were screenshots in a magazine, like maybe the magazine had access to like a like some like some kind of tape or some kind of test screening of it and maybe whoever wrote the article would still have that content. I feel like that's something that probably should have been looked into. Um, a, a user in the same Twitter thread claims to have seen the pilot aired on the television network TCC, claiming that the pilot was only a minute long. However, with no sources to confirm this claim, it's currently unknown if this is factual. I would probably say it's not factual. That pilots don't air on TV. They just don't. A video by the YouTuber The Elect Plays 92 would reveal the existence of a VHS screener for the Earthworm Jim cartoon series containing footage of the pitch pilot. According to the Elect Plays 92, the VHS screener was given to various video game news publication journalists to report about the cartoon series. He would go on to say that he would provide more information about the VHS screener in a separate video. However, this has yet to come to fruition. So I guess putting this together with the other part I just read, maybe the magazine had access to this same screener tape that this YouTube user has, and there's more than one of them floating around out there. Again, I feel like the magazine lead should maybe be looked into more. Availability. The whereabouts of the Earthworm Jim pilot is currently unknown as of the time of this writing. Efforts have been made to contact individuals who could possibly have a copy of the pilot, but no new footage has surfaced. It's possible that another copy of the VHS screener exists, but it's debatable if the collector or current owner of the tape would wish to upload the pilot online. A full copy in Windows media format was previously available from storyboardpro.com, but said site has since gone offline. I was not aware that the pilot was once available on storyboardpro.com. I feel like that could easily be like looked into on the Wayback Machine to see who uploaded it and to contact them to see if they still have a copy of it. I, I, I feel like there are a lot of little pieces here that like people didn't really put together and maybe like you could actually maybe find this or at least get better leads. I mean, I'd be surprised if, like, you know, no one looked into it because they don't think the current owner of the tape would wish to upload it online. I mean, you might as well ask or see if you could find someone else that has one. I mean, the guy with the sealed tape, I can understand, but, like, maybe there's someone else that, like, has a tape that doesn't know people are looking for this. And then you have a bunch of screenshots from the magazine article, and, yeah, this was the guy I was thinking of that had the tape that someone showed me his video once, that he does have the screener, but he doesn't want to open it, I, I think. And there's the... TV promo with pitch pilot content in it. And then there's a bunch of other like WB lost media. So lots of other WB lost media. So with that said though, um, I think that's going to do it for this episode of exploring lost media wiki articles, but thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this series, let me know if you want to see more episodes, I would like to get through uh, more of this list. So um, if I didn't get to your request this time, I will do that next time. And if you have requests that weren't in this twitter thread uh let me know in the comments down below and i'll add them to this list and it'll be a cool little uh series to kind of cover and explore more articles and topics that you might not know exist and myself as well because i learned quite a bit from this video so um with that said thanks for watching guys as always and until next time finn hey guys i hope you enjoyed the video be sure to check out some of my other lost media videos thanks for watching and until next time finn